Hey everyone, I'm Stephanie, and I believe that all readers should read children's literature, especially adults. So that's what we do on the Kid Lit Love podcast. We celebrate all things children's literature, picture books, early readers, middle grade, and young adult novels too. Whether you're an adult reading to your inner child or connecting the young readers in your lives with fantastic books, you've come to the right place. Each week, we'll talk to a different children's literature author and discuss their books, their hopes and dreams for readers, their writing process, and much, much more. So grab a notebook to build your TBR, and let's get to today's episode of Kid Lit Love. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Kid Lit Love podcast. I'm Stephanie, Kid Lit Loving host, inviting you to another weekly conversation with a children's literature author. Today, I'm talking with Lynn Kelly. Lynn is the award-winning author of multiple middle grade novels, novels like Chained, Song for a Whale, and her newest, just released this past April, The Secret Language of Birds, a novel that I think needs to be on everybody's TBR staff. I can't wait to talk to her about this novel that had my heart. So we are just going to get right to it. Lynn, welcome to the Kid Lit Love podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Oh, I, I can't wait to dive into the book. Um, right before we recorded, I showed you my sticky notes that are sticking out of the yes. size of all the parts that I loved and can't wait to bring up. But before we do that, I would love for you to just give us a little bit of background on you, your writing, your books, and how you came to write middle grade novels like this for kids. Sure. I actually started writing back when I was a special education teacher. I did that for just a few years. Um, anyone who's a teacher or has been a teacher will not be surprised to hear that teaching doesn't leave time for anything else. Um, so when, when I started writing, I didn't I didn't keep that job for very long. And thankfully had another I could I could um, go to. I, I don't mean that, um, you know, quitting your job to write children's books is is a feasible plan for most. But I've also I've been a sign language interpreter for longer than I than I did that. So I just went back to that as the only day job while I um, finished my first novel, which took a lot longer than I I thought. But um, probably good I didn't know that going into it. It would be six years from idea to finished book, but um, that's where I was when I started. So, and I, neither of these jobs I planned on doing, I hadn't planned on being a teacher or an interpreter or a writer. So I just stumble into things and discover, oh, I love this and I'm going to do this forever. So um, with the story that first came to me, that was Chained. And I got the idea for that when I um, found out about um, captive elephants, uh, an anecdote about them, that if they are captured, like a young elephant is captured when it's very young and um, it's captured for a circus show or something like that, it'll struggle really, really hard to break free. And then when it gives up, it gives up forever. So then years later, decades later, you could have a full grown elephant held in place with this little rope or chain. It could only break away from and, and get free if it knew that it was strong enough, but it won't because it tried that and gave up. Um, if that's true about it, about elephants, then um, as much as I love them, that's one way we don't want to be like them. And so that idea sparked the story idea. And at first I was thinking, oh, I could write this down and tell it to my students at school. What a great um, illustration of success and failure, which was the speaker's point in the when I first, first heard that story is don't be like an elephant if you fail at something. So I thought this could be something interesting to tell the students at school. And it grew from there. And I, I thought, okay, maybe this is something good that could be for a wider audience than just my own students in my classroom, I could figure out how how does that happen? How do you how do you write a book and then how do you get it published? Um, helps that I've always been a big reader, um, but I'd never thought of really writing a book as something I could do. So I started working on it from there, and then about three years later, had a draft that was ready to to send to editors finally, and then another three years, I'll, I'll fast forward through all that, but another three years to um, get the agent and then editor, and then of course more revisions, and then time to just wait for, for it to be its turn to be published. But, but that was Chained that came out in 2012. And then I thought, well, one, I, I've spent a lot of time learning how to write a book and get it published. So 
I, I want to keep doing it for that reason. But thankfully, I do like it, doing it, even though it a lot of time and a lot of work. I love taking an idea and figuring out what the story is behind that. And then, you know, ideally seeing it as a finished book on a shelf. So I'll, I'll do that again. I'll just keep writing books for as long as I can. And so the second book was Song for a Whale. Do you want to, yes. even though we're not talking about it yeah. in depth today, definitely tell, tell listeners about it. Right. I, um, that was in 2015. I got the idea for that book and I was, uh, just scrolling through Twitter one day and thankfully at the right time to see this post fly by, um, I saw a photo of a whale and saw this lengthy caption under it and scrolled back to see what that was about. Cause I, I've always loved animals. I love ocean life. So I was curious enough to scroll back and see what that was about. And it, um, showed it was it turns out to be it was just a stock photo of a whale because the the real life whale that I wrote about um, no one has ever seen in person no one has photos or video that we know of um, but the caption um, talked about this whale who sings a song that other whales can't understand it's like he's out there singing his own language so the real life whale called blue 52 or the the loneliest whale um, 52 hertz whale um, is this one who sings at a frequency much higher than most whales do and probably can't be understood by others. And I was so intrigued by that and just kept thinking about this whale. And after, you know, waking up in the middle of the night, which is unusual for me, still thinking about, about this creature, um, I thought, all right, I, there might be a story here. So we, we look for those ideas as writers, I think. There, there are just these ideas that don't let us go. And that lets us know there are probably other people who would be fascinated also, and there could be an audience for this. So um, I started writing about this whale and then uh, came up with, okay, now who's the character who's going to tell this story? Um, and some writers might um, have told the story all from the whale's point of view. And I, thankfully that wasn't done yet. It, I would have been a fan of it, but I was thankful that there, there weren't any books written um, about this whale. And I always thought of it as um, it being a contemporary fiction from the point of view of a character who feels a close connection to this whale and wants to track him down. So then I came up with my character, Iris, after brainstorming, okay, who is it? Who would this kid be who for some reason feels like she understands that weird song this whale is singing? She has something in common with him. And then it took a couple days and then it hit me, Oh, yes, I work with people every day who have that experience. So maybe because it's an everyday thing for me, it took a while for it to click. But that's the experience of almost every deaf person I've met, or at least the, the deaf adults um, who grew up as the only deaf kid in school or one of a few. And so they had that experience of being lonely, even when surrounded by others. And so this whale is, of course, surrounded by other ocean life and other whales, but they don't share a language. And then my character, Iris, doesn't share a language with her classmates around her. So when she learns about that whale, she's the one who says, yeah, I understand that song and I need to go tell him somehow. So she's <laughs> she uh, makes this lofty goal to go um, track down this whale somehow and then let him know that someone out there does hear him. Yeah. And then Iris makes a little comeback in... She the does language of birds. And one thing right. I love, you know, in hearing you talk about your books, number one, it sounds like you are just curious and yes. you give these new facts and they find you. And then thankfully they don't let you go until you share them. We've got elephants in book one, we have whales in book two, and then we have birds and a certain kind of whooping. Or, oh, I almost, I just almost <laughs> gave it away. A certain kind of bird that you'll talk yeah. about in a minute. It's um, on the cover, I, so it's not a not a huge spoiler to say. That's, true. that's, that's okay. true. Um But I I love how I can see that element now come up across right. all of us as you as you talk about it, and you said something about like, oh, I love this, I love this. I could do, you know, I could see myself doing this, and that's that's the same trail that some of your characters are following in the books too, which is one of my favorite parts. Right. There's this sheer love and interest in something for whatever that personal reason is yeah. so one of the favorite my favorite parts of the book and being able to see iris come back into this book was wonderful too i think it has and i'll let you explain it in a second but for me the book just had it's got all the things it was relatable it was fun it was interesting full of curiosity i just loved it i just loved yeah. it but Thank before you so i much. gush about it and <laughs> ask you a whole bunch of things about it 
I would love for you to tell tell listeners now about the secret language of birds, and we'll dive a little bit deeper into this one. Sure. Well, I was um, brainstorming what to write after a song for a whale. I was so happy that I I did learn about that unusual whale and wrote a story about him that that did get published and that readers have connected to. Um, but he's a hard act to follow. Um, you know, what do you write after you <laughs> write a story about a whale that that can't um, be understood by any others? Um, so I was um, trying to come up with what am I going to write next? And I had been thinking about Nina again from Song for a Whale. She was a very minor character in just a few chapters and a source of annoyance. And I had not thought of writing a, a book with her as the main character. And so that just came to me a couple of years ago. I started thinking about maybe it would be interesting to get to know this character more. And it could be that um, it's because other um, readers had actually liked her, which I, I didn't expect. Um, and so I started exploring that more. Some people had said, um, oh, I, I kind of felt sorry for Nina. I think she was trying to be nice to Iris learning sign language and maybe Iris should have given her a chance. And I was thinking more like, well, she wasn't respectful of her space. And, right. <laughs> um, uh, you know, Iris did try to tell her, I don't understand you. And she just kept trying harder. It, it's kind of like shouting at someone who doesn't speak your language. It doesn't help to get in their face and yell at them. That's kind of what she was doing. Um, but I thought that was interesting. And I, I think it is interesting how readers take different things from books. There are different layers and there are different things that we will each connect to, diff different characters or events. And so I started thinking more about Nina and, and wondering, okay, what is her deal? Why is she like that? Why is she someone who is so desperate to show off what she knows, even when it's not much? Um, why is she trying to pretend she knows more than she does? And why does she accidentally push someone away when she's trying so hard to be friends? So I explored that character more, which I, I would need to do in order for her to be you know, worthy of her own story. I had to get to know her as a really three-dimensional character and not just this you know, minor character in a, in a few chapters. And uh, so I, I kind of like that idea of um, having her tell her story. And we, I, I thought even then we might see some of the Song for a Whale events from her point of view there. So that, that was fun to get into. Um, but what would her story be? Um, I didn't know. So I was actually brainstorming on the phone with my agent for a long time. What could I write next? Maybe something about Nina. And I said, uh, maybe something about birds. You know, it was during, you know, the pandemic lockdowns. A lot of people started noticing the birds out the window and getting into that. Um, and so as we're talking, she starts, you know, searching online, like Texas birds, and I don't know what else. And she said, oh, here's a Texas monthly article. Did you know that whooping cranes are nesting in Texas for the first time in over a century? No, I had no idea. I, I had not not heard of that. So, and I even get the magazine, hadn't read that yet. So, um, so there's where the story started. Okay, I think Nina will see that. And I did figure out as I explored her character more and developed her more. Okay, she's someone who goes all in on whatever she's interested in. In Song for a Whale, that was sign language. And in this book, it's going to be birds. And so chapter one shows where that fascination starts. And then she is all about birds now. And then at a summer camp in East Texas, which is where the, the real life um, whooping cranes showed up. That's the area they, they showed up in because um, they, they do belong to Louisiana, but we are right next door. So it makes sense that they, you know, for them, probably a short flight or, or walk over to East Texas. And so I'm going to give this sighting to her. She's going to see this nest that is in Texas and she knows enough to know, I'm pretty sure I'm seeing a whooping crane, um, but they supposedly don't live here. And oh, now there's another one and there's a nest. And I know that doesn't happen here. So um, she'll uh, go from there on her on her journey. She's also, um, she's discovered it because she and her new camp friends were exploring a part of camp that's off limits. Um, to be fair, there is a haunted old cabin out there. So they of course had to go explore it during the first full moon. And when everyone else saw the, you know, five foot tall white figure screaming in the marsh, they all, they all ran off also screaming, but Nina's the one to stand there and, and watch and then thinks, okay, that's not a ghost, but it's something just as surprising. <laughs> it's this, this giant bird that does not live in Texas, supposedly, but there it is. I fell in love with Nina. There is yeah. so much to love about Nina. Yeah. I think. Um, my favorite thing, and I just love how, especially now knowing um, 
kind of getting your your background thinking. I just love how she is all in. Yeah. And she's all in in a couple of different ways. But the the first way that's just so apparent is her love of birds. And like you said, it's not just, oh, I like birds. It's <laughs> I'm going to bird watch every day. I'm going to climb the tree. I'm going to have my notebook. I'm going to have my app. I am going to have my brother and sister kind of make fun of me because of how yeah. much I, I love birds. And for me, I always love seeing people who love something. Even if I don't love that same thing, there's just something about someone letting themselves go all in on an interest just because that I think just lights me up and probably lights a lot of people up. And her enthusiasm for birds was just so contagious. Right. I did think you, it's, um, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask, did you in that pandemic time brainstorming with the bird idea, was that you? <laughs> did you get oh, involved right. in this as you wrote the book? I was curious. I kind of did. Yeah. And what I, what I was thinking of when you said that is um, that I, I think it's Lois Lowry who says that um, we should give our characters something to be obsessed about um, because, and it, even if it's an interest that we don't think we have, you know, someone who's not interested in birds, for example, we just love following a character who's obsessed with something and seeing where they, where they take that. Yes. Um, but yes, for myself, I did um, enjoy watching the birds in the backyard, um, watching them come to the feeders. And especially um, I, I was so um, delighted to have a nesting family of barn swallows on the front porch. And I think that's around when they showed up, if it was 2019 or 2020, when they started showing up and then they would come back every year. And I loved, you know, seeing the the parents on the nest and then got to where I could tell when the eggs were close to hatching or when they had, because they were on the nest more often rather than taking turns as much. Um, watch the rebuilding they would do when they when they came back the following year, and then to see the the hatchlings, and then finally to see them uh, fledge. I I just loved watching them, so I I got really attached to that family, and I I moved um, away from there in December. It was actually my mom's place. I I got to live with my mom the last five years of her life, and so when I sold the house and moved, I left a note for the the new buyer with you know helpful things like. Oh, fire alarms and and maintenance and all that. And I put pictures of the barn swallows and said, oh. I know there are ways to keep them from nesting if you really don't want them there, but look at them. I mean, it just I put the pictures there to show look how cute they are. They have these grumpy, adorable little faces. So I found it worth it to just hose down the front porch now. <laughs> so um I I just love seeing them. So I I just, you know, wrote that and then, um, you know, here are a couple pictures and I, you know, put a cardboard box out there when it gets close to fledging time to give them a softer landing when the, cause always someone leaves before they're ready so they can have right. that softer landing when they're, they uh, leave the nest a little early. So I, I hope they're doing well. I'd love to, I kind of want to drive by and see how they're doing, but that might be a little creepy to go a little walking up to the front porch <laughs> so when, to a house that's not mine any longer. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe yeah. a little bit. I I admit the same thing. Since I've read this book, I've been more observant outside. I've been trying right. to pay attention to the different kinds of birds I'm seeing, the different sounds, like learning as Nina did, learning how to tune out some of the other things. Yeah. And it's just on one and see where it's coming from. I felt like your book helped me be more present in oh, wonderful. my life, which which I love because my brain goes a million miles an hour. And whenever it slows down, it's so nice. And yeah. your book felt like it gave me permission to do that. Oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. And Nina has to do that when she's at camp and, and not rely on her apps that she's so used to um, yeah. and just listen. So, which is, you know, it's an interesting hobby for her as someone who, you know, hasn't noticed, you know, a boundary until it's, it's too late. And then having this hobby where you have to stand back and watch and listen, or you're not going to see what you want to see. You're not going to learn what you want to learn. So um, good challenge for, for this particular character. Um, but yeah, I, I too, I love looking at the, at the Merlin app and seeing who's out there calling or singing and then um, see, and then also see if I can guess on my own before I turn it on, then use the app to check myself. Um, I have one out here that I swear, I swear it's, it sounds like a duck, but I was looking up going, I know there's not a duck perched in that tree, but it sure, it sure sounds like, apparently it's a fish crow, which I hadn't oh. 
hadn't seen or heard around, I don't know what it's eating around here, but um, yeah, so it's, it's out there sounding very duckish in a tree. Well, that is a new one for me too. (laughs) Although admittedly, I I previously did not pay much attention to birds and their songs out there. And what I love too, is I learned in your book, um, cowbirds, cowbirds, birds that purposely lay their eggs in other nests. And I thought, wait, yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah, there are a couple kinds of birds who, um, who do that. I think they're referred to as brood parasites. So they, uh, they don't build their own nests, but they will just find someone else's and lay an egg there. And often it's larger than the others. So it's not great for the others that do um, belong in the nest. Um, and the, the parrot will end up raising the cowbird as its own, but it's, uh, it's often a lot bigger. So it gets more of the food than the others. And I just recently have seen, um, like just the past few days, I've seen people post on Facebook, um, look at this nest in my yard. There are three small eggs in this one big one. What's that? And people have answered, oh, it's a cowbird. And some will say, oh, go ahead and get rid of it because it's going to take too many resources from the others. And then other people chime in and say, no, the cowbird parents are nearby and they're watching. And if you get rid of that egg, they're going to wreck your nest. Oh so you just have to leave it and let it play out as it will. Um, so that's interesting. But yeah, the most fascinating thing I learned is that um, in some some areas, they've gotten to where their um, their eggshells will match the uh, native birds nearby. So they might have. So you'll see if you look up cowbird eggs and oh cuckoo eggs, I guess cowbirds and, and cuckoos are the ones who do that. Um, so I think it's cuckoo eggs um, that will um, have such a variety of shell colors because the eggshell color can depend on who else is around, um, whose nest, you know, might they <laughs> take, you know, or might they, you know, claim for their egg. Um, and if it's a better match, it has a better chance of staying in there. Yeah. I, I admit, I read this book with Google close by because I was looking up things as I was, yeah. because I wanted to see it and I, I wanted to imagine it. And the, the amount of facts I learned within the context of a beautiful story, I think was why it, they were, they were so powerful. The other thing about Nina that I loved that I wanted to bring up, we mentioned that she goes all in on birds mm-hmm. and something she loves. But another thing she tends to go all in on, which I think a lot of us do, is feeling her emotions and yeah. being quite sensitive, um, which sometimes can be seen as a detriment, right? Mm-hmm. But it's really such an asset to to a character, to a, a human. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about a term that I cannot get out of my head now, which is fossil sad. Oh, yeah. That whole, that whole part of the story. I just, I can't, I cannot get it off of my mind because I think I I just related to it. I related to it so much. I know a lot of readers will likely relate to it too, but can you talk a little bit uh, about that? Oh, yes. And um, I, I'm so glad you, you picked up on how she felt and um, and her emotions, because that's usually what I need to work on most when I'm writing a story and revising it. I have a lot of notes like, but how does how does she feel here? How does he feel? What's he thinking? And my first thought is always, well, I thought it was obvious. He's sad <laughs> or she's frustrated. But I, you know, I guess it's not. Then I have to step back and say, well, obviously, it's not obvious if they're asking. So <laughs> need to have a little more there. So I'm glad that that came through. Um, but yeah, I think that too, it just came from an article I read. Um, I came across while I was writing this and something I hadn't even thought of before, but that it, it would be pretty rare for a creature to leave a fossil because so many animals are soft bodied and they're not going to have anything in them that is going to last long enough to leave a fossil. You need uh, to have something like, like bones um, or something else that's going to last in order to um, have a fossil, you know, left behind after you're gone. Um, And so when I read that, I thought, Oh, that's kind of sad to think of. There had to be so many animals we don't even know about. Certainly there were many, many soft bodied animals, you know, well before we were here and, um, and, you know, long before, you know, any, any fossil history. So none of those, you know, they would have come and gone without us even knowing about them. And I'm, you know, so curious about, about what else was here. And it's an impossible question to answer since we have no fossil evidence of those. And so I, um, yeah, ended up putting that in there too. I thought, you know, that's something Nina might connect to. She, she does feel, feel a bit invisible in her family and 
you know, doesn't help when in chapter one, they, they leave her behind, um, on a road trip, you know, with, <laughs> you just accidentally, you know, take off without noticing anything's wrong. Um, so that didn't, that didn't help when, um, she realized, oh, they could just leave without noticing any that I'm, that I'm not here. Um, and then, so I thought, oh, I think this, this will be something that touches her too, when she learns, um, and I'll have it as part of her backstory. She was a kid and learned in this science day camp, um, a lot of animals, um, live and die and leave no record there's no trace of them ever so that um she kind of clings to that feeling that oh you could you could just disappear and nobody knows um so then she and it becomes one of those things that they say in her family because she she was so um so wrecked by that news she just had to leave <laughs> leave day camp and, and and couldn't explain you know why it why it affected her so badly and and just you know just said let me be fat, sad about fossils rather than when her mom's trying to come up with an explanation like so I'm sure just sad about fossils and just just let me be. Um, so that became a thing that they would say in in their family that if you're you're just sad and you can't quite explain what it is, you're just fossil sad. Yeah, and I loved that because I think a lot of kids will relate to it. A lot of readers will relate to it. But what struck me as well was as a parent. You know, I think mm -hmm. adults should be reading as much children's literature as they yeah. can for lots of reasons. But I played through in my mind like I bet I did that. I am. I'm the person who always tries to explain things and have something make oh. sense because because it makes me feel better. But sometimes we just need to feel. Right. We just need right. To feel and that's okay too. And I thought that was such a strong, not really a lesson, but a strong um permission slip, I guess, for readers to be like, oh, that that's I'm like that sometimes. Okay. That's that's Perfect. okay. I, I love yeah. it. And it and it is realistic um for us sometimes to just not be able to articulate why we're feeling what we're feeling. And it's been kind of freeing to um, actually use that as a writer too. <laughs> like when I am trying to, you know, to re revise and, and make it more clear how this character is feeling that it is very realistic that uh, sometimes we're just not, um, not sure. And I, I don't want to use it as a, as a, a cop out and just, you know, explain away every emotion like, well, I don't know, but um, sometimes we need to know what's behind this, uh, but I can have the character wrestle with that too. Like, why am I so upset about this? Um, and kind of um, try to work through that. And sometimes we we just are, things affect us and we don't always um, know or can't quite articulate why that is. Yeah. But as she finds out art and doing something is sometimes the way that things can just make sense and click into place. I loved that element of doing art for no reason really, side by yeah. side with her aunt can help in so many ways. It can calm you down. It can help you unwind from a busy day. But sometimes when, and you explain it so beautifully in the book, but when you when you stop thinking about the thing and you just let your mind be, your your mind just comes to your rescue yes. <laughs> sometimes. So I loved, I loved how she worked through a lot of what she was thinking through, um, through art, which is something that I try to do because I was the kid who stopped doing art because it didn't look good in the end, right. who's now the adult coming back to right. art for the opposite reason. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, me too. I enjoy doing some watercoloring and it's never, it is kind of freeing that it's, it's never going to be anything that's up for sale. It's right. I, I just enjoy, you know, putting paint to paper and Nina is someone who I figured out avoids doing things that, that she's not good at. Um, and she got the message a long time ago. She wasn't good at art and she wasn't going to do that again. Um, she's someone who doesn't like making mistakes. Um, and that, of course, leads her to, you know, probably making more mistakes and trying to trying to overcorrect and then getting the opposite of what she wants, which is wonderful when a character does that. It's, you know, we hate it if it's ourselves, but um, I love it when a character ends up getting the opposite of what they wanted and even get what they're afraid of. She wants to be seen as knowledgeable. And when she, you know, oversteps and tries to show off, you know, what she knows, um, it becomes obvious she really doesn't know what she's talking about. Um, so she's she's a you know a little older and wiser at thirteen now, but um, still is um, is going to try to avoid things that she's um, figured out she's not good at, or she got the message that she wasn't good at. So I love giving her that discovery again with her her aunt who just says well, so what, let's just go make bad art together. Like it's, yes. and that was, um, you know, something I think she hasn't, hasn't experienced so much as someone just saying, okay, we're, we're just going to do it because it's, it's fun. And it's something we can enjoy. It's not, we're not yeah. creating a masterpiece here. So yeah. it's fine. 
And one of my sticky notes in the book was when her aunt said to her, um, some of my favorite things are things I'm not good at. Right. I just loved that one. Yeah. I loved that yeah. line. There's one more thing about the book that I loved. And it, to know why I loved it so much, I think you need a, a, a little bit of background on me. Um, listeners likely know this from listening to my podcast, but I don't know. Are you a one word of the year person? Do you choose one word to guide your year ahead? Oh, I'm more like the person who thinks of a word and then then forgets what it was <laughs> or um, forgets where I wrote it down. So, I mean, I think it's a great idea. I, I haven't uh, been so great with the execution of it. Well, I I used to pick a word of the year and then the pandemic hit, you know, my word just didn't hold true anymore. And so ever since the pandemic, I have been choosing a word of the month, Oh, okay. just a, a word that I could hang on to. I usually read books about it and I write about it and I just try to bring new things in my life around that one word. So there was one word in this book and you're probably like, I know what word you're going to say. <laughs> That I I also couldn't stop thinking about, which was, and I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Zugunru. Am I saying? I that? think so. That's probably yeah. yeah I was saying Zugunru. Um, Zugunru. It's Zugunru. that's probably close. Um, it is a wonderful German word because, of course, they're going to have a word for everything. <laughs> so. And I love that word, which is basically idea. You know, this this inner knowing, this inner signal, this inner something that tells the birds it's time to go. It's time to move. Yes. It's time to migrate. And I, I loved how that sort of played into the human world as she learned about that concept. I, I just love that because as adults, sometimes we ignore that innate yes. idea that we get or those little urges or those instincts. And again, I was like, oh, there's another permission slip. When you get that urge. Yes, that, there you go. That's something. You no, know, yeah. Yeah. So I yeah. just love that you put that in there. It's another word going to add to my collection. And I, I just think it, it just adds to so many of the layers that I loved in this story. Thank you. I, I was so happy. I, I discovered that also, and it was something I had not read. Um, I, I looked it up after I learned about it, but I had never seen it or heard it before. Um, so thankful I did, because I think it worked out so well in the story, but I was actually at a, um, uh, it's an international crane foundation center in Baraboo, Wisconsin. And I, I live in Texas, so it was it was a journey. Um, but I wanted to go there for their um, they have like an open house, like a member day um, once a year. And so I I did that a couple of years ago, and it's an all day event they do, and they have presentations, and they have every um, species of crane there. There are only only two in North America. We have the whooping crane and the sandhill crane, but there are others around the world, and they have a, a pair of each there. So. I really wanted to go to, for one, to see the whooping cranes up close because you wouldn't normally get close to them. If you did see them in the wild, you would want to keep your distance. Um, and mainly for the um, the presentations, because I saw that they would have all day, you know, presentations by crane experts. So there aren't many times I'm going to find that going on. Um, so I, I went to that and I guess it was during, I think it was during the Q&A of one of the sessions I'm so thankful to whoever asked the question that, that brought this up, but something about migration and maybe because the, the birds in this place are, um, you know, they, they of course don't migrate. They're in a, this is a, a captive um, center where they are. And I think someone asked about migration of, of birds that officially don't migrate or um, are captive. And then that was the, the word that came up that, um, um, Zugunru is this um, instinct. It's a word for the instinct they have to take off and fly when it's time. So even birds that are in captivity or like this Louisiana population of whooping cranes I wrote about, they they are non-migratory. Um, so supposedly they live there year round, but once in a while one takes off. Um, so we have, besides the ones who've wandered into Texas, um, they had one that went to Nebraska and they I think they had to go get him and bring him, bring him back home. Um, and they notice um, Oh, when it's it's that time, it's it's coming to be that that time to migrate. They get restless and they just act like they're about to take off, um, even though they they don't or they can't. So there's something in there that tells them, even if they don't have a migration path, um, then or they or they can't take it. There's still something in them that tells them it's time to fly away from here. Yeah, uh, I hope listeners can like come to understand that this book has so much there's oh, so much great. for the reader there's so many themes so many lessons 
and just this fascinating layer of birds and whooping cranes and all of the things that happen. I loved it. I loved it from the first to the last page. I think, as I mentioned in the beginning, it should be on everybody's TBR because every reader, there's an entry point for everybody somewhere. Oh, that's great. And your book. And I just, oh, thank you. But you are working on another, right? Can you tell yes. us a little sneak peek into your next project? Yes, as it happened, there's been this weird overlap. Um, it's just coincidentally that this this book just came out and next year's book is due. So <laughs> I have a book that's due to come out in fall of 2025. Um, that's, you know, assuming I can wrap up this revision and turn it in um, in mid-May. Um, so that's just, you know, a little over, gosh, maybe three weeks away from now. And so that one is called Three Blue Hearts. And it also takes place in Texas and also features an animal. So in this one, uh, my character, Max, is a 12-year-old boy who lives in Houston. He is on a Gulf Coast town with his mom for the summer. Uh, when they arrive, there's a bad storm. The power is out in the beach house. It doesn't look like a great start to the summer. Um, but when he's walking the beach the next morning, he finds an injured octopus. And he does love animals. He's um, gone to his uh, day camps at the zoo. For many years, uh, doesn't know what to do with this, with a, a beat up looking pale octopus on the sand, but um, he knows he can't leave her there. And there, there's nobody else around. Um, and so he's thinking, well, maybe this is one time I'm actually in the right place at the right time. Um, I don't know what to do, but I, I'm not leaving her here is all I know. Um, or leaving it here. He doesn't know till later this is a girl octopus. Um, but he is able to find help for the octopus and then ends up um, taking care of her throughout the summer. Oh, it sounds wonderful. Another relatable character, yeah. their animal to take a deep dive, interesting look into. Yeah. I will note that down, fall of 2025. Right, right. Three blue hearts. <laughs> Three blue hearts. And then maybe when that comes out, you'll you'll come back on and you'll chat with us about that one too. I'd love I it. I would love that. Yes. Okay. Well, can you tell listeners where the best place to find you online is to, to follow your projects and to grab your books? Sure. Um, probably the easiest place is my website. That's lynnkellybooks.com. So it's my first name, last name put together, plus books, lynnkellybooks.com. Um, yeah, socials, you know, that's, you know, that's shifting since um, Twitter isn't what it used to be. Um, but I'm Lynn Kelly there. Um, I'm Lynn K. Kelly on Instagram. I, it, it seems like that's where I'm most now. So just put another K in there for Instagram. Okay. I will be sure to put links to the website, your social media handles, and links to your books as well in the show notes to make it easy Thank you. for listeners to find you. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today about the secret language of birds and your whole journey as a writer. I've so enjoyed our conversation. And just know I'm going to be bird watching for a long time and keep the book very close to my heart. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, you're so welcome. And listeners, thank you for listening to another episode of the Kid Lit Love Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Kid Lit Love Podcast. You'll find links to all the books, resources, and ideas mentioned in the show notes at alitlife.com. And if you want more, you might like to listen to my other podcast called Get Literate. It's a podcast that explores all things books and reading, notebooks and writing, and everything in between to build a life you love. One more thing. If you love what you listen to today, please take a moment to rate and review the podcast or take a screenshot of the episode and text it to a bookish friend. This helps the podcast grow and builds our bookish community of kid lit love. Thanks for listening.